Welcome AP Physics Mechanics students. Today's review topic is energy. Here's a list of what I'm going to be talking about today. Again, you don't have to write this down because this is what's coming in the notes anyways. But first I'm going to begin by defining work and power. Then I'm going to define the different uh, various forms of energy in this topic. I'm going to define them, uh, present the definitions as equations, mathematical definitions. Then I will present the two main ideas, the work energy theorem, and then the bigger idea, the law of conservation of energy, really the main idea of the topic. And then finally, potential energy graphs. I'll show you how to, you can interpret them and analyze the motion of objects based on the, the potential energy uh, graphs the object experiences. So let's begin. Okay. So here, I list the definitions for work and power. There are three general ways in the AP curriculum that you might be uh, required uh, to calculate work. Work, first of all, uh, the most basic formula is force times distance cosine theta. So as I mentioned when we studied this, you cannot use the everyday definition of work within physics, like for example, if you have a job and you do a certain task and that's called work uh, in an in, in economic sense, in physics, it, unless you're pushing something with a force and it moves a distance and those two are not 90 degrees to each other, the force and the motion, then you have um, work. Otherwise, if the force is zero or the displacement is zero or they're oriented 90 degrees with respect to each other you have zero work done. The more sophisticated way to write this expression mathematically is with a dot product F dot D displacement vector. A dot product is a special kind of product uh, vectors and I mentioned this in class when you're dealing with scalars 2 times 3 is always 6. But when you're multiplying vectors length 2 times 3 with a dot product, the answer can be any number between positive 6 and negative 6. If the two are in the same direction, the 2 and the 3, and you multiply those, you do get positive 6. Then you can get maybe 5 if the angle's like, you know, something like 20 degrees, you plug in 2 times 3 times cosine of 20 or whatever, you might get 5. You could get zero when they're oriented 90 degrees to each other. Uh, and then as the angle goes beyond um, uh, uh, 90 degrees, so for, ex for example, if you have a force like this and a motion like that, then you can get negative work all the way up to negative six when they're opposite of each other. So dot product a different way, um, oh, the method, one method of multiplying vectors. There's also a cross product, uh, not in the curriculum, but uh, there is such a thing. A dip. So there are actually two different ways to multiply vectors. Well, I'm getting a little too theoretical. So the units of work are newtons times meters and cosine has no units. So newton meters, you could say I did 10 newton meters of work or we uh, more often rename a newton times a meter a joule. Okay, so you could say I did 10 joules of work also. If the force varies, then you cannot use force times distance. What you have to do is do force times distance a tiny infinitesimal distance over which the force is roughly constant and you'll find the work, the joules for that very tiny displacement, maybe, maybe like a millionth of a meter force times distance. Then you add up all those force times distances, those joules, from one x-coordinate to another, and you get the total work. So that's basically the logic behind integration uh, in terms of work. Also related, uh, as we learned when we were studying integration, when you integrate a function, you're also finding the area under the graph of the function. So uh, if you're presented a linear plot like this with f and the motion the object uh, undergoes, as a function of uh, the, the displacement, then you can find the net work by taking any area above the x-axis and counting that as a positive quantity, and any area below the x-axis when the force is in the opposite direction of the motion, 
then you subtract off that area. So that's another possibility for calculating work. So force time distance cos theta, f dx integrated, or net area of a graph. Another definition we're going to learn today is power. Okay, so let me move this up a little bit. Okay, so power. Uh, first thing I want to uh, point out is that sometimes in a problem, it's not referred to as power, it's referred to as the rate of energy change or the rate at which work is done. Uh, some kind of um, use of the word rate and rate implies the definition of the quantity divided by time. Like when you have an hourly rate, you make $15 divided by hours, $15 per hour. So when it comes to power, it's the rate of not money, but the rate of the work or energy or joules. So the most basic formula for power is work over time. So power is not how strong you are, which a lot of people think. Someone uh, can be very strong, lift a thousand pounds, but if they can't do it quickly, they don't have a lot of power. You could have a very small amount of work divided by an even smaller amount of time, a tiny fragment of time, and you can generate a lot of power. It's the ratio of how quickly work is delivered, the joules per second, which we rename a watt. Now here, as I mentioned, when we studied this, is an unfortunate fact of this equation that there are two different w's in the same calculation. This w is lowercase w, which represents the work in joules. So joules goes up here. Whereas the power over here is measured in watts, which is a capital W. A lot of times students will have a calculation and they want to plug in 100 watts over here because that's the W, the watts. No, that's the W, the work over here. The 100 watts goes over here. Okay, and this is the W in joules, maybe 10 joules and then you're looking for time or something like that. So just keep that in mind, a little awkwardness with the uh, units and the double use of the word, the letter W. Now, if you're, uh, you have this varying, this, this, this calculates the average power, but if the power varies as a function of time and you want like the instantaneous power, what you're going to have to do is take the derivative. So you convert this to calculus instead of work over time dw dt. Uh, and you get the power, the instantaneous power. Or power could be force times velocity cos theta, or in other words, force dot velocity. So the more force at the higher velocity delivered gives you more power. So there are two basic definitions, work and power. All right, we move on now to energy. So, all right, kinetic energy. Basically, all of these are work. If I take an object and maybe like a block of wood like this and I launch it, in order to get it moving, I have to push on it with a force times distance, right? So I push with a force times distance and then it starts moving. So to give something velocity, you actually have to do work. So if I throw this block across the room, I do work in the beginning, force times distance, and then as it's sailing through the air, it has that work stored in its motion. And then later on this side of the room, when it hits the wall, it delivers that force times distance into the wall. So kinetic energy is like work I put in, which it has stored in the motion, and when it hits, it gives that work back. The amount of work, you could calculate it using force times distance and all that business, or people have derived that it's equivalent to the one-half mv squared. That's the work. When you see something moving, a car, going down the road, a certain mass, certain velocity, you calculate one-half mv squared, that turns out to be the force times distance cos theta that the engine delivered in getting the thing moving. Okay, but that's what kinetic energy is. It's stored work in the motion of something. You could also lift something and you could put work in. For example, if this is up and I lift this, I put work in because it wants to fall down, right? So I put work in and then when I let it go, it falls and hits something and delivers that work back. So that's what potential energy gravitational is. 
It's when I lift something and I put work in, it's basically like a rechargeable battery lifting an object. When it falls, it's like depleting the battery. Charge the battery up, deplete the battery. And the amount of energy that's stored in something lifted is equal to mgh mass gravity height that you lifted. Similarly, I could stretch a spring. Well, I don't have a spring because they're all at school locked away uh, with the school closure. But if I had a spring like this and I pull it, I pull force times distance to stretch it. And when I release that spring, it shoots back. And so I put work in to stretch it, and then it snaps back and gives that work back. How much work? 1 half kx squared. Okay, that's for a traditional, typical spring, just like a metal coil like the ones we used in our physics labs. Now in general, the you can calculate the potential energy for any what we call conservative force. What is a conservative force? There's a couple definitions and I don't want to get into it too much because today is review, not studying the lesson from scratch. But one definition of a conservative force is that when you move something from point A to point B, it takes a certain amount of work against that conservative force. When it returns back or reverses its motion and comes back to the initial condition, uh, initial position, there's a certain amount of work along that path to bring it back. Work one to bring it there, work two to bring it back. For conservative force, the work one way is the opposite of the work coming back. So for example, when I lift this, if I lift it slowly, I do a net work of maybe five joules. When it falls back down, I do a negative five joules amount of work because I am holding it up, but it's moving this way. So when I lift it, I do positive, and then when I lower it, I do negative work. And that's a conservative force, force of gravity. Friction is not. If I slide this horizontally and I push and it takes five joules to bring it here, to bring it back, I did force times distance force distance cos zero degrees I did positive work to bring it back I have to do force distance cos of zero degrees I do another positive five joules positive five joules positive five joules and basically that means it's not a conservative force the work is not opposite now why the minus sign because technically it's not the work that I do when I lift something or move it against the conservative force because that varies. I could, if this is up, if I push this slowly, I could do five joules, moving it from here to here. If I push as hard as I can, and then maybe I deliver instead of five joules, a hundred joules, because I pushed harder. So lifting it, it's, uh, what we want to do is figure out the work done by the force itself. So when gravity points this way, and I lift this, then the motion and the force are 180 degrees apart from each other. So lifting something, the conservative force does negative work. Force times distance. But when we lift something, we're obviously adding potential energy. So even though the work of the conservative force is negative, we put an extra minus sign so we have negative negative and then lifting corresponds to positive delta U. When something falls, the conservative force pulls this way and the motion is this way. So the conservative force does positive work. But when something falls, we know that the potential energy should be negative. It's losing potential energy. So even though this integral is positive, force times distance, same direction, we put in that minus sign again to indicate that when something falls, this negative potential energy change. So that's basically the uh, way to calculate potential energy for any conservative force, integrate FDX. Now, here are some formulas. A lot of students blindly remember these. And no matter what kind of spring is thrown at them in an AP physics problem, they say, oh, U is equal to 1 half kx squared because it's a spring. Not so. Let me show you some calculation examples. Okay, so. 
if the for we're dealing with a force of gravity, then the force is minus mg downward. So to find the potential energy change when I lift the object from 0 to h, I have f instead of dx, I use dh because I'm lifting it upward. So these are constants and dh simply integrates to h. So I have minus minus mg, the constants, dh integrates to h from limit 0 to h. I skipped a step but basically get mgh. So you see the mgh, we could memorize it or we could always derive it from this. This is the more uh, general formula for all potential energies. Like for a spring, f equals minus kx. I skipped all the integration but you could see that if I integrate this, I get x to the 1 becomes x squared, and I divide by that, I get 1 half kx squared if the force is f equals negative kx. So that's why we have, one, but we can't say, oh, springs are always 1 half kx squared. Because what happens when we have a spring where the force is not minus kx squared, kx, but minus kx squared? The potential energy in that case will be negative the integral. So we add 1 to the exponent, cubed, divide by the new exponent, 1 third kx cubed instead of 1 half kx squared because the force is kx squared instead of kx. Another example, what if the force of a spring, some kind of spring, was k minus kx cubed instead of kx? Integrating 1 fourth kx to the fourth. So again, us is not always equal to 1 half kx squared. Most of the time it is, but if you see they're starting to give you some kind of force function in the problem, you've got to not use 1 half kx squared and use the integration to find the potential energy. Also note here, I could get the force back here if I take the derivative of this. 4 times 1 fourth is 1, and then to the third. 3 times 1 third is 1, and then squared. 2 times 2, 1 half is 1, and then to the 1 power, and then of course the minus sign. So this is one way to define potential energy, but if you have the potential energy, you could take the negative derivative and get the force, as you could see from these examples. One other little point I want to make is that often in physics problems, we define something called the mechanical energy, which is just the kinetic and gravitational and spring or any other kind of potential energy uh, added together. Notice we don't have any thermal energy, electrical energy, chemical energy. Those are not mechanical energies. Mechanical energies are just these. So sometimes they'll say, what is the mechanical energy? Or is the mechanical energy conserved? And just so you know, that's these kinds of energy and not the other kinds that, because, you know, there, there are more energies than what I presented obviously here. All right, so. Continuing on. So, so far we've just learned definitions, okay? But nothing about what that, those terms say about the universe. The first such expression is the work energy theorem. And what it says is that if you supply a network onto an object, that network is equal to the change in the kinetic energy of the object. So here I did, I do a couple quick examples to show you how the work energy might come into play with a calculation. The first example, I'm not writing in complete sentences here, I'm just trying to be efficient. I lift a 2 kilogram mass with a force of 25 newtons up. Now it, it, it weighs 20 newtons, the weight is 20, right? The weight is, is the same as the force of gravity. 2 times 9.8 or we can use 10 is 20. So I'm pushing more than that. So it's obviously from Newton's laws, and it's like an elevator problem, push up 25, gravity's 20, so it accelerates upward, okay? And it goes for 8 meters, and if the velocity original was zero, determine the final velocity. So we could solve this with Newton's laws and get the correct answer. We don't need the work energy theorem. As I said when we were studying in class, and at the beginning of the Newton's law review topic, Newton's laws are actually the foundation of the course. Everything else is built off of Newton's laws. You can derive this from Newton's laws. And what that means is it's redundant. 
it's technically not necessary to mathematically analyze the universe. If you solve this problem with Newton's laws on the test, on the AP, it would have to be acceptable because that is a correct method, it's correct physics, and you would get the same exact answer here anyways. So it's perfectly valid. But I'm solving it with work energy because we're trying to see how it works so that you get prepared for that concept on the AP. So we start with the concept work net is equal to delta K. And then I realize, well, first I drew the force diagram, right? Force, force upward, force gravity down. And then I realize that there's actually two different forces, so there are two different work values. There's one from the force applied by whatever's doing the lifting, maybe it's a machine. And then there's the work done by the force of gravity. So that's how we get the network. We add up the two different works involved from the two different forces. Delta K is delta anything is the final minus the initial. But I lightly crossed this off because the object began at rest, so it had no initial kinetic energy. So filling in the work done by the 25 Newton's force, F, D, cosine, zero degrees. Why zero degrees here? Look at this force arrow and the displacement arrow. They're in the same direction, both upward. So that is, those two are zero degrees apart, right? This would be like 30 degrees apart, 90. No, they're zero degrees apart, okay? So, all right, so that's the cos zero. Then the gravity's 20 Newton force times the motion of eight meters, but the angle between the gravity and the displacement is uh, 180 degrees. You could see that if I take these two pencils, well, let me do it this way, and then I swivel them like this, and when they're opposite degree direction, I swivel to 180 degrees. So those two in opposite directions are 180 degrees apart. And then I have one half mv squared final. The initial was zero, so it's gone. So the um, force applied is 200 joules of work, does 200 joules of work, gravity does one, negative 160 because cos of 180 is negative 1. So basically then I'm solving for V, I get 6.3 meters second. Note also that sometimes they ask for then the power. They say, well, this was lifted into 1.5 seconds, whatever it is, and then you do the work done, the positive uh, 40 joules over time, and that would be the net power received, or we could do the power delivered by the uh, 25 Newton force, and that would be uh, the 200 joules divided by time, and that's the uh, power of the lifting agent, the machine or the person or whatever is lifting this object. Okay, so another example that's pretty common. Example two, a 2,000 kilogram car is moving at 20 meters per second it skids to a stop. If the mu kinetic is 0.7, determine the distance it slides. Now, the, uh, when a car skids to a stop and the tires are screeching, that's kinetic friction because the surfaces are rubbing past each other. When a car stops without screeching the tires, it's static friction because the tires in the road are not rubbing past each other. They're just, it's the friction of contact right, without slipping is static. But the car is skidding, so we use the kinetic value. Okay, so, uh, a note. I didn't draw a gravity and normal force, but, and, and also this isn't a force diagram. I just put the two vectors that are important here for our calculation. The motion's in the forward direction, but the force of friction to stop something has to be in the backwards direction. So, I have to visualize that to know that when I do calculate the work, the theta is 180 degrees in this case when you're skidding to a stop. But I use the work energy theorem. Work net is delta K. This time the final kinetic energy is zero because the car skids to a stop. So V becomes zero in one half mv squared. The work net is FD cos theta, force of friction, and 180 degrees as I mentioned over here and then minus the initial kinetic energy, one half mv squared. Plugging in the numbers, the force of friction is mu f normal. Mu times 2,000 times 9.8 is the normal force. Well, I use 10, so 20,000. 
distance is unknown and I plug in here notice the minus signs went away the cos 180 gives a negative sign in this so that no more minus signs and I get 28.6 meters by the way, this is just a little aside that's probably not going to come up on the AP, but it is a concept for everyday life. This shows why speed is dangerous when you're driving. If you double your speed, this side of the equation quadruples because of the squared in the velocity. The distance is to the one power. So in order to preserve the equality, doubling the speed quadruples this side of the equation this side of the equation has to quadruple too to preserve that equality. The force of friction, that comes from your tires, that doesn't change. That means you skid four times as far if you go twice as fast. Triple your speed. Say you're going 90 miles an hour in a 30 mile an hour zone. You go triple the speed, that makes nine times the kinetic energy, nine times the stopping distance. And that's why speed is so dangerous and police are after people for speeding because the stopping distance increases not proportional to velocity but you really increase uh, stopping distance rapidly all right so work energy theorem now we move on to the bigger main idea okay the law of conservation of energy okay and the law of conservation of energy states that the total energy of an isolated system remains constant. And I underline the key ideas, the total energy, because energy can change. You can gain potential or lose potential, or the same with kinetic or spring energy. So you could be losing individual or gaining individual kinds of energies, but the total, the sum of all of them together, that's what remains constant. For a system. Not any system, an isolated system. So as a pendulum is swinging back and forth, potential energy and kinetic energy are interchanging. We maybe we have 10 joules of potential at the bottom 10 of kinetic, then 10 joules of potential back and forth interchanging. And that stays constant unless I give the pendulum a little tap. Maybe then I have 12 joules total because it's not isolated. I tapped it. Then there's air resistance, so that 10 joules, maybe as it's swinging, gradually becomes 11, then, then I'm sorry, 10 joules becomes 9, then 8, then 7, so it, lo quote, loses energy. Well, not really. It's the fact that the system is not isolated. Energy is still conserved. If we could put that pendulum in a vacuum, separate it from all influences, it would sl swing like that with 10 joules constant forever. So here are some just quick conceptual examples. I didn't go into calculation with numbers because I wanted to emphasize here the ideas. What you do when you solve an energy conservation problem is you ask yourself uh, three questions uh, twice. So you ask yourself six questions, really. When I lift this pendulum to the side, I ask myself, does this have potential energy gravitational? Does it have spring energy? Does it have kinetic energy? When I'm holding that pendulum, obviously there's no kinetic energy. People say, how do you know there's no kinetic energy? Well, the formula for kinetic energy is one-half mv squared. So, without velocity, because I'm holding in my hand, there's no kinetic energy. There's also no spring anywhere here, so there's no spring energy. So, the th third question, does it have gravitational energy? Yes. People say, how do you know that? MGH is the formula. We've got a mass, and it's up high. So we have gravitational energy, okay? When this swings down over here, we ask ourselves the same three questions. Does it have spring potential? No, there's no spring. Does it have gravitational energy? No, there's no height, mgh. Does it have kinetic energy? Yes, because it's swinging down here and it's moving. So three questions here, only one was yes. Three questions here, only one was yes. And so energy says, the total energy, conservation, uh, law of conservation energy says the total energy remains constant. So what we have before has to equal what we have after. Okay. Next example, I've got a spring up against a wall and a ball, you know, on that spring. And then the spring is going to pop open and shoot that ball sideways. 
Again, I asked three questions, and then I asked three questions. Do I have gravitational energy? No, no height. Do I have kinetic energy? No, the ball is resting. Do I have spring energy? Yes, I have a spring that's crushed in, 1 half kx squared. So I have spring energy, so I jot that down. Same three questions over here. Do I have kinetic energy? Yes, it's shooting across the floor. Do I have gravitational energy? No, it's not a pi. Do I have spring energy? No, there's no spring that's crushed in or stretched out. So only kinetic. And then I say energy before equals energy after. Okay? U spring is 1 half k squared. Kinetic energy 1 half mv squared. And I solve for what they're asking for. Maybe they want to know the speed. Or maybe they tell you the speed and they say, well, how far was the spring crushed in the beginning? Or maybe we know that and the speed and the mass and they ask for the spring constant. Something is unknown you're solving, it, solving for. Next example. This spring is crushed and then it shoots a ball and a ball rises to maximum height. We want to know maybe how high it went or something like that. So three questions and three questions. Do we have gravitational energy here? No. This is down low, no height, mgh. Do we have kinetic energy? No, it's at rest. Do we have spring energy? Yes, 1 half kx squared, we got a spring that's crushed, so we write that down, u spring. Same three questions here. Do we have gravitational energy? Yes, mgh, height with a mass, you got it, you got potential energy. Do we have kinetic energy? No, not when something reaches its maximum altitude, it stops momentarily. And then do we have spring energy? No, the spring is popped open. So we only had UG out of those three. So energy before, 1 half kx squared, spring energy, equals energy after, M mgh. One final example here. Uh, this is a ball up against a crushed spring. The spring pops open, shoots this up a hill, and then this is sliding across the hill up there. So how do we analyze this from an energy standpoint? Three questions and three questions. Do we have gravitational energy up here? No, we do not, because mgh, no height. Do we have spring energy? Yes, we do. We've got a spring crushed in, so we jot that down, u spring. Do we have kinetic energy? No, we do not, because 1 half mv squared, there's no velocity, no motion. So out of the three, we only had spring energy, we jot that down. When it's up here on this plateau, we ask the same three questions. Do we have gravitational energy? Yes, we do. MGH, it's up high. Do we have spring energy? No, we do not. There's no spring that's crushed or stretched up there. So no to this question. And then finally, do we have kinetic energy? Yes, we have a mass moving with a velocity up there. So we got gravitational and kinetic there. So we write a formula the spring energy before, energy before, equals, that's the law, the two energies after, okay? The point is, the formula changes every single time. You don't want to start memorizing these. The only way is to, uh, to solve these energy conservation problems is to generate a new formula for every cir single circumstance. And the way you do that, again, is ask yourself the three questions, the three kinds of mechanical energies before, spring, gravitational, kinetic, and ask the same three questions after. The yes are the energies that enter into the calculation, and those change depending on the various setups. And I could come up with more and more examples, but I think at, at four we've seen enough. Hopefully you, you see the pattern of how to generate all these conservation equations. Well, sometimes it's not just those three energies that are interplaying into, in, in a situation spring, kinetic, spring, kinetic, gravitation, okay? Sometimes we have other forms other than mechanical energy, and then sometimes we say, oh, energy's lost. I put loss in quotes because it's not really lost. It's just that uh, it doesn't stay, the energy uh, of, of the system doesn't stay as the three kinds of mechanical energy. An example, Let's suppose something is sliding down a hill. Maybe this is you in the winter sledding. So you start up here, and you don't have spring energy, you don't have kinetic energy, you just have gravitational energy because you're up high. At the bottom, all you have is kinetic energy. You're moving. But it turns out that these are not equal because of the friction along the way. You could either conclude that from the work energy theorem or thinking about friction rubbing and generating heat along the way. 
So really, at the end, we have gravitational energy beginning. At the end, we've got kinetic plus heat in the ski slope and the sled. So there's a missing energy here. Well, we could say loss. This is bigger than this because of the heat that was gone. Some of the gravitational energy went to heat energy. So we could calculate that loss as the beginning energy minus the final because this is bigger, right? So maybe this is like 10 joules, this is 9 joules, and then we had 1 joule of loss. That's basically the thermal energy in the ski slope and the sled. All right, so one last topic, potential energy graphs. So a reminder that potential energy for conservative force is negative the integral of f dx from one coordinate to another, and that the force is negative derivative with respect to x. So I have here an example. Suppose they give you this potential energy function. And it's x minus 2 squared plus 1. And we've got a 2 kilogram mass released from x equals 0 with 0 velocity. And we want to know the speed at 1 meter and the acceleration. That's what that means. I got lazy. I didn't write out. At 1 meter also. And often they'll give you a graph like this, okay? So let me just move this up a little bit. Okay. So they give you a graph like this. And the object's released here, and we see that it has 5 joules of potential off the graph, or you could plug in 0 into this formula, you see that it's 5 joules. Now, as we said, the negative derivative of the potential energy graph or function is the force and the derivative is the slope. The derivative here is negative. If I put my pencil down tangent to the graph, the derivative, the slope of the function in the beginning is negative. The negative of the slope is a negative negative is a positive answer. So the negative derivative, the negative slope is the force towards the right. So just from the way this graph is shaped, I could see that there's going to be a force this way. This object's going to accelerate to larger x-coordinates. When it goes beyond this low point at 2 meters, now the derivative of the function, the slope, is positive. And the negative of that slope is negative. A negative of a positive number is negative. And so that tells me the force is now in the negative direction. So from a force standpoint, I could see that this object, when I release it at x equals 0, it will accelerate to the right, and then here it will have 0 force because the slope is 0. And then as it's going this way, it's going to be decelerated because it's going to be moving that way while the force is in the opposite direction. And eventually you will find that it goes up to this point, x equals 4 meters, and oscillates like this. But the way to interpret instead of with forces and accelerations, to interpret that with energy, what we do is we say in the beginning it has zero kinetic but five joules of potential. That's the mechanical energy of the object. We draw a horizontal line because the mechanical energy is conserved. It stays constant throughout its motion all as it's moving back and forth here. Its mechanical energy is always five. Okay? And then the way I can analyze the motion is by finding the gap the difference between mechanical and potential and that will be the kinetic energy and the potential energies here so from here down is what the potential is from here up is the kinetic so we see that it's gaining kinetic energy as it's moving to the right till it gets to this point x equals 2 and then it starts losing kinetic energy until it gets to here where the kinetic energy becomes zero and we have all potential again and then it oscillates and starts gaining kinetic energy, losing kinetic energy, stops. Gains kinetic energy, lose kinetic energy, oscillates back and forth. So where the mechanical energy line crosses the potential energy line, that represents the limits of the motion. It'll oscillate between 0 and 4 meters back and forth. We see that from those intersection points. Well, let's get back to what we're supposed to calculate. That was just interpreting how you analyze the graph. You see that at one meter, we could actually read these right off the graph. We could see that at one meter, 
Okay, if we write mechanical energy is K plus U, the mechanical energy is 5 joules, the kinetic energy is this gap, and the potential is here. So that's all I'm saying. Energy is conserved, kinetic plus uh, uh, potential. The mechanical, as I said, is 5. I fill that in. The kinetic is 1 half mv squared. We're looking for velocity. And then the potential, you could plug in 1 meter here and solve. Or you could plug, just read from the graph that at 1 meter we have 2 joules of potential. Either way is fine. But I just got 2 joules right off the graph. Okay, So I solve and I get the velocity. Now part B, what about the acceleration at 1 meter? First I need to find the force. And the way I do that is by taking negative the derivative of the potential energy function right here. So negative, there's the potential energy function. I got to use the chain rule and do 2, well first of all here's the minus sign, bring the 2 to the front, subtract 1 from the exponent, so bring the 2 to the front, subtract 1, and then multiply by the derivative of x minus 2 inside, which is just the derivative of x, which is 1. And then the derivative of 1, maybe I should have wrote plus 0 here, but derivative of 1 is 0. So there I distribute, there's the function for the force as a function of x. I plug in 1 meter and I get 2 newtons. So I know the force here is 2 newtons from the derivative. And then I do a equals f net over m and I get 1 meter per second squared. Okay. Last thing, just another example. I just want to show another kind. This was a curved graph. We actually had to take a derivative. Sometimes they give you linear graphs like this. And so there's no function to take a derivative of. Okay, so, so, so we could analyze with, you know, the extremes of motion. I didn't give anything about the motion of the object, where it started. But I just want to just show that if you have a linear graph like this, you can't take the derivative, but you know that the derivative of a function is the slope of the function. So rather than saying f equals negative du dx, we could say it's the slope of the u function, delta u over delta x. So at 0.5 meters, right here, the force is the slope of this whole line, which I could just do rise over run. So I could say 1 joule, 1 meter, that's the final point, minus the initial point, which is 5 joules at 0 meters, and I get plus 4 newtons because of the minus minus. Okay, so the force is that way for newtons. The force, oh, by the way, maybe I should have wrote it, F at uh, 2 meters, well, maybe I'll jot that in here. And why is it 0? Because the slope here is 0, so there's no force. Okay, But at 4 meters here, it's the slope of the line at 4 meters, so I could again do negative rise over run. The final is 5 joules and 5 meters, that's the final point, 5 joules, 5 meters, and the initial point is 1 joule at 3 meters, and I get negative 2.5 joules. So that's it, that's the uh, topic of energy, okay, again, what we studied, okay, we studied the definitions of work and power here. We studied the definitions, uh, forms of energy, kinetic, gravitational spring, formulas for those, memorize those. And then also we learned that in general, spring energy is not always one half kx squared. You might have to integrate if we have different kinds of springs presented in a problem. F is negative derivative of u. We learned that what mechanical energy is. We learned the work energy theorem, work net is equal to delta K. That tells us a little bit about how work affects objects, okay? But the bigger idea here is the law of conservation of energy. Really the main idea, the heart of the topic, the total energy of an isolated system, all those kinetic gravitational spring, add them up and the numbers should stay constant if the system is isolated. And then also potential energy graphs. So that's energy topic. I uh, hope you followed along. And uh, again, um, as I said before, I want to remind you, 
in the future if a review video seems too long and you're starting to bog down you feel like you're you're overloading of course pause the video right that's the beauty of video versus live in class and go take a break go have something to eat go for a little walk or something come back and watch the rest of the video so that your mind is fresh absorb it in pieces and then certainly review the notes again and again uh, as you go along uh, through the topic. So that's the energy topic uh, and I'll see you in the next video.